All right, so we are live with Toronto's Associate Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Vanita Dubey, once again answering your COVID-19 related questions. Doctor, thank you for joining us again today. Hi again. So my name is Dilshad Berman. I am a web writer with City News and Society News, and I will be moderating this chat today. So doctor, first weekend after stage two reopening for Toronto, lots of questions, lots of concerns, but lots of happy people as well. Um, so let's uh, actually jump right into it. Are you ready to go? Yeah, let's go. Wonderful. Okay. Um, let's start off with some testing questions. Uh, Delta asks, I have chronic sinus issues. Can I have a saliva or mouth swab instead of a nasal swab? Is that an option that is offered? The two swabs that are available right now in Ontario are the nose swab, but some places also have a throat swab. There is no saliva testing um, that's being done right now in Canada. It's not clear that the saliva tests are actually a better test, um, but we don't have that available right now, and not in Ontario. But you can ask for a throat swab if you feel that the nasal swab is not going to be effective for you. Okay, so the throat swab is different from a saliva swab. That's right. The saliva swab is usually at the side of the throat. The throat swab is at the back of the throat. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But you can certainly get that. Okay. But, but I want to say the nasal swab is the best swab. Right. So even if you have sinus congestion, maybe that's why you should get the nasal swab because it will pick up if there's any virus uh, at the back of your nose, um, it will pick that up as well. Okay. Okay. Um, we have another question from Sam who asks, how does the COVID-19 testing actually works? Is it humans testing sample by sample or are all the samples put into a machine? What is the actual process? It is what's called a molecular test. So it's using the latest scientific technology to be able to do the test. It's not, classically we had, um, culture tests where you would actually have to place a culture and watch and see if the virus or bacteria grow, grew. That's not the case here. So it does rely on diagnostics or uh, machines, uh, certain reagents to do. The tests right now are done individually per reagent per test. Um, there are some places that are doing what's called batch testing. So they may take, say, 20 samples do the tests at once. If any one of those are positive, then they'll do them individually. But right now they're being done individually with um, lab science uh, technology. Okay. Um, Robin asks, more on testing here. Robin asks, who will be able to access serology testing to see if they had COVID-19 and recovered? I'm waiting just like you, Robin, to find out who's going to be able to get this test done. Um, uh, when will it be available? How can you get the test done? And also, more importantly, how do you interpret the results? If the results are negative, does it really mean that you didn't have it? And if the results are positive, what does that mean? How long will you be immune for? So I'm waiting just as you are to, to get the answers to all of those questions. So definitely TBD, like it's coming, but TBD. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, Sophie has an interesting one. She says, since a lot of people have no or weird symptoms of COVID-19, um, why don't we plan on implementing antibody testing for COVID-19, especially for frontline workers? Again, antibody testing doesn't necessarily tell you that you have an infection right now. So right. that's why the, 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 the test that we have in the nose or the throat, that is, if that's positive, it's pretty indicative that you either had an infection now or had a, a recent infection. Um, and the antibody tests, um, it's not clear that they're going to be able to help us with that. We, we are waiting for that. I think the most important thing is if you have, uh, if you're not, if you're somehow not feeling well compared to the way you were, a new sore throat, a new runny nose, um, just not feeling well, even if it's mild, those may be symptoms of COVID, go and get tested. Mm -hmm. um, Sometimes if you have no symptoms at all, it's just because you're in the early stages and your symptoms will come a few days later. So any symptoms at all get tested. If you actually never had any symptoms but were in contact with someone who you know has COVID and you had close contact, well, then that might be a reason to get tested, especially if you have no symptoms. Okay. Um, and then some more generic questions. Ahmed asks, is COVID-19 a disease now that just everyone is going to get at least once in their lifetime? Like, is it something like chicken pox or measles where it's just, you know, you have to get it? 
is that's what we don't know about that yet. I mean, with measles, actually, not everyone gets measles now. Um, yeah, I didn't get it. I got measles. I got the vaccine. So I think that's I think that's where we're going. Is that if we actually have a vaccine, it means that not everyone will ultimately get this infection. I think it's a good good point in that is this going to stay with us now forever? We don't know that that answer either. Mm-hmm. We know that we've had it since sometime in December um, and it's still it's almost July now and we still have it Um, and um, but we think that this might be a virus that might hang around um, and that's why if we have a vaccine we can actually offer some some broader protection but we know something like SARS when it came we were able to actually stop the spread and then SARS went away and so if Mm -hmm. that's the case for this that virus as well well then we won't actually even need a vaccine um, as urgently. Um, so, so again, more to come. We're yeah. following this very closely. Yeah, for sure. It's a little early to tell, I guess, if it's going to be one of those things that we all just have to go through, like like we went through chicken pox. Um, yeah. Okay, Busta asks, what makes one vi- virus more contagious than the other? So what makes COVID-19 so much more contagious? So COVID-19 is spread through a respiratory droplets. So when you cough or sneeze, those droplets can then spread to others within six feet. And then it can, it can easily contain, um, get into you when, you know, either if it gets into your, your face or you rub it into your eyes, that kind of thing. Um, but different viruses spread in different ways, which makes them more or less contagious. When they spread from person to person, sometimes that, that can impact how contagious the virus is. We have something in medicine called the R naught, the reproductive rate. It says if one person got the infection, how many more people are they likely to infect? And we know for this virus, the R naught is 3.5. So it was 3.5 in March in in Toronto, and so one person was infecting three and a half other people. But we know now that it's actually one or less than one. And so we know if we keep our measures in place, one person will infect one other person or maybe not even one person and so there even despite how infectious the virus is we can do things to make it less infectious and we've seen that actually in our city yeah absolutely i mean we're moving into stage two already lots of things have opened up this weekend so definitely progress is being made Mm -hmm. um so then speaking of stage two now uh let's see who is this from alex alex asks uh, what is the reason for not mandating masks for indoor use, like shops and restaurants and malls that are now reopening? Um, surely, you know, there's an expectation that cases might rise because there's more movement, people are getting out and about. Um, so is there a way that we can actually mandate masks indoors in businesses? So a few things to say on this. One is that you're absolutely right. Indoor settings are higher risk compared to outdoor settings. The reason for that is probably because in indoor settings, there's less air circulating. So if there's a droplet that goes, it may take longer before it falls to the ground. We're a bit more crowded when we're indoor settings. And if someone is contagious, they may have had contaminated the, the environment around us. That's probably why indoor settings are more risky than say in an outdoor setting where the air is constantly flowing. And so if there's a droplet that might fall to the ground, it won't contaminate some of our surfaces. Uh, in terms of making it a, a law or mandatory, I can tell you that uh, in the City of Toronto, City Council is actually meeting today and tomorrow, and there is a report uh, that's before City Council tomorrow to discuss um, some of these issues, and so um, it is something that we're, we're actively looking at, and, and I would say stay tuned to when it comes uh, before Council tomorrow. Okay, okay. And then a related question to that. Currently, uh, patios are open, hairdressers are open, things like that. Um, And there are very strict rules as to maintaining social distance, wearing masks, sanitizing, that kind of thing. Um, But how is that being enforced in terms of, you know, going to a patio, actually seeing that people are being kept six feet apart and same for hair salons and things like that? So Toronto Public Health has put out uh, guidelines, which are really requirements for um, barbershops, nail salons, tattoo salons, um, and for restaurants that they need to follow. Some of the requirements actually come from the provincial legislation. Mm-hmm. It's called the Emergency Ma- Management and Civil Protections Act. Some of it is very clear in there. It says that restaurants, for example, can only offer 
services in patios or through takeout or delivery services. So some of it is there. Some of it is through Toronto Public Health requirements. There's two things that I will say about this. One is um, the requirements are there. If, however, you find that there is a business uh, operator that's not following requirements or it seems to you that it's not a safe they're not taking COVID precautions. Mm-hmm. In the city, if you if it's a Toronto facility, you can actually call three one one, and we do have uh, enforcement officers who are um, going to these places. We also have public health inspectors okay. who uh, do inspections, especially for the personal service settings, the barbershops and nail salons, right. um, to be able to make sure that they are run in safe ways. Oh, okay. So there's actually enforcement, like in terms of bylaw officers or public health officers that are going out and doing checks. That's great. That's right. So if you find a place that you feel is not safe, then please do uh, call us and let us know, or you can email through on one as well. Okay, great. I actually wanted on a personal note, I wanted to mention, as you can tell, I have just got my hair cut and colored. um, And I did it right at the outset of stage two, because I felt like you know, they would be taking proper precautions. Everybody would be on high alert at this point. Um, and I just wanted to, to let everybody know, actually, um, my salon was amazing. They made me feel extremely safe. Um, temperature checks before walking in, sanitization of all stations at all times. I was made to sanitize my hands. Um, they kept us well over six feet apart, one stylist to one person. I think those are all really important hallmarks to Um, check on before you actually go into a salon, make sure that they're making you feel safe and that they're keeping their staff safe. Um, And for me, my personal experience was really great. And so I think that if we can take that as a microcosm, hopefully everybody is doing those things and keeping everybody safe. Yeah, I think, you know what, I'm really glad you had a good experience. Your hair looks great. I think I think what I want to say to everyone is, please, you make sure that you take your precautions in those places Mm -hmm. as well. We mm-hmm. know right now in Kingston, Ontario, that there's actually uh, an outbreak of COVID related to a nail salon mm-hmm. where they were not taking those precautions. And so I think if you, you know, make an appointment to go there and you, and you feel, wow, there's a lot of people in here, there's not physically distance, or wow, nobody is wearing a mask and you're supposed to wear a mask, you leave and then please call us to report it so that we can follow up on that. Right. I think that at this point, there's going to be a lot of like personal experiences and, and a lot of sort of we have to take the responsibility to make sure that we're being served safely as well. That's right. We all have to do our part. Mm-hmm. OK. Um, OK, let's uh, let's move on a little bit from here. We've got some questions actually coming in live right now. Um, let's see. Oh, this is about uh, washrooms. Is it safe to use uh, public washrooms in parks or other outdoor areas? Is that going to open up soon and will it be safe to use? So Toronto Public Health has worked with our parks, uh, forestry and rec department to give them guidelines for for washrooms in public spaces. Washrooms are actually really important because Mm -hmm. first of all, when you need to use a washroom, you need to use a washroom, but also they provide a place for you to wash your hands. And we know that washing hands is really important uh, when you're out and about. Uh, we have given, we have reviewed some of their uh, guidelines and provided guidelines for them on cleaning and disinfection of washrooms. Some of the guidelines include making sure that they're cleaned at least twice a day and doing a deep clean once a week for these places. Mm-hmm. I think uh, if you use a washroom, what you need to make sure is that um, you clean your hands, especially after you leave, leave the washroom, try and avoid surfaces. But if you touch surfaces, that's okay. Just make sure that you wash or sanitize your hands uh, on your way out uh, as well. And try not to, when you're in the washroom or waiting for the washroom, make sure that you keep that distance from others as well. Okay, okay. So again, you know, they might be open, but we have to take all of the precautions. It's just sort of a new normal now for us. That's right, that's right. Okay, another one coming in right now from Conchetta. She asks, uh, this is back to uh, vaccines. What if people have an allergic reaction to the vaccine, like some people do to the flu shot? So there will be people who won't be able to take the vaccine because they may be allergic to a, a part in the vaccine. Sometimes mm-hmm. vaccines have antibiotic, um, and we know that if you're allergic to that antibiotic, you can't get that particular vaccine, for example. Uh, with all vaccines, we know that some people can't get it for medical reasons, and that's why for vaccines, when a vaccine is available, we actually um, count on 
most people getting vaccinated, so then it creates that herd immunity. Yes. And when most people are vaccinated, it acts like a wall so that the virus or bacteria can't come into the community, protecting those people who can't be vaccinated. Or frankly, even people who get the vaccine, but because they have a weakened immune system, maybe they're older and they don't mount a strong immune response, they will also be protected. Right. So the idea is if you can't take it, take it. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Um, more on testing. Another question coming in just now from Justin. Um, he asks, why can't we do a test in the mail for everyone so we all get tested, like a self-test? Yeah, I think if we were to have the saliva-based testing, if that actually becomes a really good test, then I think that's something that, that we could consider. Um, but right now, because the test is required to go at the back of the nose, it's not the kind of thing that you could administer on your own. Um, and so that's why uh, we, we don't have that option available right now. Okay. Um, okay, let's move on to some other questions here. Uh, CW says, Dr. Dubey, I deal with MS and on Monday, my sister is going to have her husband pick me up and go for a visit for a couple of hours. Um, she hasn't been out at all since March 3rd. Um, as long as they do everything right, like masks and you know sanitizing and everything, is there any harm in her basically riding in, in the car with another person? Yeah, you know, it's a really good question, CW, and I think that where, where we're at right now is we have to evaluate our risk for everything we do and decide if the benefits outweigh the risk. Mm -hmm. And there's no question that having a visit with your sister is going to be really important for you. And so I think, you know, if you've decided that that's really important for you, and I agree with that, then it's about taking the precautions um, to get there. So we talked about how in a car, sometimes the risk can be quite high because you're in a closed setting. It will depend on how long is the drive. Make sure that the driver and the passengers are wearing masks. If your brother-in-law sits in the front and you sit in the back, you each have a mask on and you open the windows, that will lower the risk as well. And then when you get to your sister's house, you know, if you can have your visit outdoors, uh, even better. Uh, keep your chair six feet apart. Even I would definitely recommend that, whether you're indoors or outdoors. And sanitizing your hands. Um, the other thing is to, uh, on our website, we have a screening tool to ask people, do you have these symptoms? And if you have any of those symptoms, just postpone the visit. That's not worth taking a risk either. Okay, okay. Um Nick has a similar question about, about a picnic. If I want to go on a picnic with somebody, do I still need to wear a mask? Do I still need to sit six, six feet apart? Um, and is it recommended that the other person also wears a mask? He hasn't been able to see his friends since the start of the pandemic. You know, thank you for asking how to do this safely. Um, if obviously you're going to visit your friend who's not part of your social circle. So regardless, we recommend that you stay six feet apart at all times because in case your friend feeling fine that day but maybe um, is about to get COVID, you don't know. Um, he doesn't know that about you either. Keeping that six feet distance is going to help protect both of you. Wearing a mask is also a good idea. Again, when you're in outdoor settings, the risk is lower than indoor settings, but it's not zero. And if, if you think that you might brush up and not be able to maintain that six feet distance, then especially uh, both of you should wear a mask. Okay. Um, and then a question about the social circle, actually. Uh, John asks, the social bubble of 10, is that a strict 10? Like if you are part of the 10, you cannot see anyone else. Or does each person get to have their own 10 people? If the idea is that your household um, combines with another household to make 10. And that you are only in one bubble or one circle. And so I think that's the important thing. It's not, it's not that you cannot be in 10 different circles. So I think that's the best way to define it. It doesn't mean, though, that the other people who you identify who are important to you that you can't see, those might be people that you would interact with, but you would make sure that if they're not part of your official circle, you would keep that six feet distance at all times when you visit with them. Right, right. Um, let's see, what else do we have coming in? Uh, okay, more about um, stepping out. Um, Sultana asks, I'm asthmatic and my son is two years old and we've been in isolation for the whole time. 
what suggestions do you have so I can start taking him out? I'm very, really not comfortable with people coming near us, especially my young son. Yeah, so I think I think going outdoors is again uh, a good thing to do. The playgrounds are closed. Uh, mm-hmm. The splash pads though are open. Um, if you were to go um, during off peak times, you know maybe first thing in the morning, um, then that might be a safe activity that you could do. Right. If you're worried about your son uh, um, walking around and um, getting too close to people, it might be something to consider a stroller. You know, some way to be able to make sure. Because children at that age don't always re- understand what it means to keep that six feet distance. So I think those types of precautions that you take um, could help protect your child and yourself as well. Okay. Um, let's see. More about travel. Let's talk about travel. Um, Lynn asks, we keep hearing the Canadian U.S. border is closed, yet I have heard of many Toronto residents traveling to the U.S. and then returning back to Toronto a week later. Who is making sure that they self-isolate upon return? Um, And why are they being allowed to travel to the United States at all? So this is a a good question. Um, Travel, right now we're a level three uh, restriction for travel recommendation by the federal government, which means that all non-essential travel is, it's recommended that you do not uh, carry out any non-essential travel. Um, And so if you have to travel, it should be for essential reasons. If you are a Canadian returning home, you will be welcomed home. If you do travel for essential reasons, when you return home, you will be, you will be required to keep that 14-day quarantine. And the Public Health Agency of Canada has a process in place to ensure that travelers maintain that 14-day uh, quarantine. There are some uh, jobs that have been given that exception. So if you're a truck driver and you're going back and forth, um, you know, when you come back, you don't necessarily need to have that quarantine. But if you're sick at all, then you need to stay home as well. But for all other types of travel, 14 days, no matter where you've gone outside Canada. Okay. Um, so let's talk about actually domestic, like within Toronto travel. Uh, people on the TTC are concerned. Concerned TTC are asked. Uh, will public health inspections be made on trains and subways to ensure that they are in compliance? Uh, we certainly uh, are working with uh, the Toronto Transit Commission. They have a lot of uh, procedures and policy in place for enhanced cleaning um, for their drivers. They have a, a new uh, bylaw that will be starting as of July 2nd, requiring uh, people who use transit or are on transit property to wear a mask. Okay. Um, and so, what I can what I can honestly say is that the Toronto Transit Commission has been working very closely with Toronto Public Health to make sure that their practices are up to date. Uh, what they can't control is why does it if it's busy if there are a lot of people around, um, you know sometimes it's not going to be possible to maintain a six feet distance, mm-hmm. and that is one of the reasons why they've made that mandatory mask uh, recommendation mm-hmm. because you. When you need to when you need to travel to work, for example, and you can't avoid that, so if everyone's wearing a mask, we'll all protect each other. Right, absolutely. Um, this is an interesting question. So every day we hear of the number of cases reported and the number of cases resolved. What exactly does resolved mean? What qualifies somebody to have a resolved case of COVID? Okay, that, yeah, that's a good technical question. Yeah, people are really keeping track of these things, and I, I love I love these questions. So resolved means that your infection has essentially gotten better. Who has a resolved infection? Well, if you died of the infection, it will never be resolved, so you will never be counted there. Um, and tragically, we've had over 1,000 deaths, and so those are unresolved. Um, and if you've had an infection, though, and you're no longer hospitalized, and it's been 14 days from when your symptoms started or from when you had your test, then you're considered resolved. So that's what makes up people who are resolved. And then we've talked about this before, but just to clarify, sometimes even after the 14 days, you said uh, you can still be shedding the virus up to 90 days. So yeah. between like, say the 14 day mark and the 90 day mark, could you still test positive? You can still test positive, but, but you won't be counted as a new case necessarily. Right. Like, uh, and you won't be uh, infectious. And so that's one of the reasons why the 14 days is used to consider results because even though you may test positive, in terms of being able to spread it to others, you won't. And so from that perspective, it's considered results. Okay, great. Um, 
this is an interesting one coming in from Irene right now. Can a hot flash set off a thermometer meant to be looking for COVID-19 fevers? Yeah, so I mean, it depends on what kind of thermometer you're using. Technically, a fever is an increase in your internal body temperature. So actually, in, in the hospital, technically, the best way to get your temperature is actually to use a rectal thermometer. And some people may find that very fascinating. Um, <laughs> That's what we use in very young infants to be clear that we have, we know what your internal body temperature is. Yes. So when you do a air thermometer, it's gauging what your internal temperature is, but it may be inaccurate. And so if you have a thermometer that's an infrared one that's just checking um, the temperature of your skin, if you are hot for other reasons, it may be incorrect. Right, exactly. When they tested my temperature for just before I got my haircut, I was worried because I was feeling very hot, like it was very hot outside. And so my skin was just, you know, hot because I was in the sun. So that's definitely, you know, not necessarily the best gauge, right? That's right. And so that's why we actually don't even recommend checking temperatures, in, in all honesty. What we recommend is that you ask, you know, about eight symptoms, whether someone has those. And you, you can just as easily ask someone, have you had a fever? Um, yeah. And that might give you as well good an answer as actually um, checking people's uh, temperatures in, in a public setting. Okay. Um, another one coming in right now. Bobby says, I am 60 and I've never had a flu shot. Should I get one this year? I am worried that I may get the flu or cold. I would, and, and right away, I would think it's COVID. So are there any distinctive differences between COVID and a cold or flu? So first thing, should you get the flu shot? Uh, definitely. The risks from the flu vaccine are very, very, very small. Um, especially the biggest risk from the flu shot is one in a million people can get something called Guillain-Barre syndrome. But we know that if you actually got the flu, your risk of getting that syndrome is much, much higher. And so if you don't have an allergic reaction to the flu, if you can um, tolerate it, definitely recommend you get it. And especially at the age of 60, you're more at risk for getting a severe complication from the flu. In terms of, you know, if you had symptoms that looked like they were the flu, how do you know it's the flu and how do you know it's not COVID? Mm -hmm. Well, by symptoms, you cannot tell, actually. Uh, and the only way to test, tell it is through testing. And so that's why it's really important that in Ontario, we're getting our testing, uh, our lab capacity increased, our assessment centers are available, so that when we head into the fall, when the flu might be spreading and when COVID might be spreading, It'll be important to get that test to see is it COVID um, or could it be something else? Right, absolutely. Um, so this is an interesting one because we've talked about this a few times now about um, pregnancy. Are pregnant women more susceptible to getting a harsher form of COVID-19 than women who are not expecting? Because apparently, I believe the CDC, according to one of the CDC's reports recently, it says pregnant women who get infected are likely are more likely to be hospitalized or in the ICU. Is there any uh, concern about that? Yeah, so we're constantly keeping up with this kind of um, evidence. If you are, if you have asthma and you're pregnant, definitely you are more likely to have a more severe COVID infection. Mm -hmm. Just being pregnant itself does not seem to be higher risk for getting a severe COVID infection. It also doesn't mean that you're more likely to get COVID necessarily, but it is something to watch for. We know in general that in pregnancy, you can get more severe illnesses. And so that may be the case right now. It does not seem like it's the case, but what I would say as with anything in preg pregnancy, it's better to be more cautious and take all the precautions you can to make sure you don't get sick in the first place. Absolutely. Um, this is interesting. Fran asks, do sinus rinses and deep breathing exercises help for mild cases of COVID-19? We don't have any evidence on that. Um, I think what I would say is if it's not harmful, um, you can certainly try it. Uh, sinus rinses help to kind of clear the sinuses. Um, there are certainly um, ear, nose and throat specialists that recommend it for chronic or acute sinusitis, for example. We know that this virus can actually live at the back of the nose. That's why we do the test that way. And so there may be something to it, but there may not be. It's really hard, hard to tell um, whether, so it's not necessarily something that you say, oh, to prevent COVID, do this. Uh, right. that, we're not there yet, but if there's no harm, then um, 
initial practice that you use ongoing differently, no evidence that by doing sinus rinses, you're at an increased risk. Okay, okay. Um, this is more about masks again. Kanika asks, uh, what, is, what if the pharmacist filling prescriptions does not wear a mask? Is that dangerous or risky? So um, if you're worried that the pharmacist who's filling your prescription could contaminate your prescriptions, um, I mean, the risk there, again, is quite low. The pharmacist should be monitoring their symptoms before they come to work. In case they may be infectious um, while they're filling your prescription, most pills actually have to be swallowed or chewed. And so we know that in those situations, um, COVID is not spread. Um, there's no evidence that it's spread through food or, or, or other drugs. Okay. Oh, wow. We are already out of time. It is one o'clock. That half hour really flew by. Yeah. So um, I, I really thank you again for taking the time, doctor. I won't take up more of your time today. Um, thank you again for joining us and hopefully we'll see you again next week. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye, -bye. Bye right. everyone. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you. Have a good day.